Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. In my recent update video, I promised that I would continue my historical reading series. In the past, we've looked quite a bit at H.G. Wells' The Outline of History, and we will continue to do so going forward. Here is a picture of Mr. Wells. However, I would like to also start talking about Wells' great antagonist, Hilaire Belloc. Belloc effectively is the exact opposite of Wells. And the two of them had a pretty intense beef between about 1920 and 1927. Before we get into that beef, let me give you a bit of background on Mr. Belloc. Hilaire Belloc was born in 1870, so he's four years younger than H.G. Wells. He was a dual citizen of France and Britain. He was born in France. His father was French, his mother was English. His father died in 1872, and at around the same time, a stock market crash caused his family to go broke, so his mom decided to return to England and raise her children there. Interestingly enough, Belloc's mother was very socially progressive. She was a feminist who wanted to uh, have women's rights. Belloc, in later life, was a member of an anti-suffrage league. So I imagine that dinner table conversations at the Belloc household may have been tense. Although, to be fair, his mother was about 41 at the time of his birth, so most likely she was not around when he became an anti-suffragist. He mostly identified as British because that's where he spent the majority of his boyhood, but he still kept a strong connection with France. In 1891, he chose to do his military service in France, and he served with an artillery unit that year, 1891. He attended Oxford, and while at Oxford, he gained a reputation as a vigorous debater. He effectively forced his way into a debate when he thought that one side was being very weak, and afterwards he was known as something like Old Thunderbolt or something of that nature. For the rest of his life, he would remain an ardent debater, and he would actually make his living more or less as a polemicist and freelance writer. He only twice in his life, so far as I'm aware, held a steady job with a paycheck. One was when he was an editor for a magazine which kept track of World War I, and another instance was in 1937 when he gave a series of lectures at a university. He wrote on a wide variety of topics, everything from children's literature to light verse to talking about his Catholic faith to talking about medieval history to contemporary politics. Belloc covered a huge swath of the human experience, and that's part of why he remains relevant, at least mostly in conservative circles. In 1906, he was elected to Parliament, and he was a member of the Liberal Party. The most famous incident in his election run is that at one stop, a heckler asked him if he was a papist, and Belloc strongly defended his Catholic faith by saying that he always attended Mass, and that he ended each day by praying into his beads. And if that gentleman did not like it, then Mr. Belloc wished that he would do him the favor of voting for someone else so that he wouldn't be forced to represent that guy. The crowd apparently went wild, whether the crowd was mostly Catholic or whether they just didn't like the bigotry of the heckler, I can't say. Still a great story either way, though. Let's see. Um, another thing to know about Belloc is that he was a contentious guy, and his feud with H.G. Wells was not his first and also not his longest running. His longest-running feud was actually with the medieval historian G.G. G. Colton. By 1920, Belloc had written a fair amount about the Middle Ages, and this had gotten him into trouble with the academic historian G.G. G. Colton, who effectively wrote an article that year saying that Belloc didn't know what he was talking about. In 1938, so 18 years later, Belloc would write an entire book about how Colton was full of shit. Colton pretty much won that debate. It was obviously his field of study, and he was widely published on a number of things, mostly um, material culture. He was a big historian of art and also architecture, whereas Well, I mean, excuse me, not Wells, Belloc was very much a layman interested in 
the church. But yeah, that that was an interesting feud because it was actually an academic historian versus a popular one who had other things going on. So not the kind of feud you would see too often today. And I might even get into that feud because uh, it might actually be as interesting or more interesting than the Wells feud. So how did he come to be in a feud with H.G. Wells? H.G. Wells' outline of history was published in 1920, and it would appear that Bellick was one of the first people to line up and get it, and he was immediately incensed by what he found. He ended up writing, over the next six years, 24 articles in various Catholic journals complaining about various aspects of Wells' work. After he had published all 24 of these, Bellick assembled them into a compilation that he called a companion to Mr. Wells' outline of history. So, Wells didn't necessarily need to respond to this because this was taking place in a closed circle, which uh, was a minority in England by this time, the Catholic population. But Wells was deeply offended because he thought that Bellick was misrepresenting his positions. And so Wells sought to counteract what Bellick had to say. When he contacted the Catholic journals, Wells was basically told that they weren't interested in his perspective. Although one journal did say that he could write a piece trying to defend his positions, but that he would be limited to strictly pointing out any... Um, factually incorrect claims that Bellick had made about what he said, and that he could not challenge Bellick's logic or reason, or his argument itself. And he also couldn't retaliate when Bellick calls him biased by pointing out Bellick's obvious biases. Naturally, Wells declined to take on an argument that he would have to lose by design. And instead, he tried to go to secular journals to get his side of the story published, but they were mostly disinterested. After all, all of the articles by Bellick had been published in Catholic journals, which were not really being read by the general public, so it was not seen as a matter of concern for their readership. Wells got pissed off, and he decided to write a book defending his book, <laughs> and it was called Mr. Bellick Objects. It was a fairly short book. And just like Bellick, Wells engaged in a lot of ad hom and got very snarky. And by the way, uh, Bellick was known for being snarky and for really demeaning whoever he was debating. Um, in many ways, if you look at the tone that both Bellick and Wells used when they were going after one another, it reads very much like the comment section on YouTube except that these are English gentlemen from 100 years ago, and they put a lot more time into the prose. But the tone is very, very similar to what you see in a lot of YouTube sections where someone write a long, uh, derisive comment about someone else's work. So I find that pretty interesting. The more things change, the more they're the same. One of the major critiques that... Oh, actually, let's get to the next part of the story. So, right after Wells published his book, Bellick read it and then published another short book called Mr. Bellick Still Objects. So, Bellick did not let this go, and he was an adamant opponent of Wells' outline of history. Personally, I think the outline of history is okay for what it is. I mean, it's clearly just a primer, which gives you the lay of the land. It's not supposed to be a comprehensive history. But for Bellick, the main problem is that it is secular and therefore misses what it means to be Western. We have to understand that in Bellick's worldview, there's basically no difference between the Catholic Church and Western civilization. Those two things are 100% coterminous in Bellick's mind, to the point that he doesn't really seem to have any interest whatsoever in things that occurred in the West before the rise of Christianity. Now, maybe I'm being a bit unfair, and maybe as I explore his writings, I'll find more uh, interest from him and other things, but for the most part, it would appear that he sort of romanticizes the period of history between Constantine and the Reformation as basically Europe's golden age, and he's very obsessed with ideas of unity and um, having a religious, spiritual basis for Western civilization, and specifically a Catholic basis. 
So, uh, yeah, it, it's a it's very different perspective than what we see with H.G. Wells. In his initial assault on the outline of history, Bellick says that Wells's book is powerful and well written right up until the appearance of man. That is somewhere around page seven, and the most famous complaint that Bellick leveled at Wells's work is that Wells introduces the concept of evolution into his history. Bellick says that evolution has been fully discredited and that by including this discredited concept that Wells was undermining the value of his own work. When and how he thinks that evolution was discredited, I don't know, but I would love to know. Um, let's see. So, aside from critiquing the historical writings of Colton and Wells, Bellick actually produced his own. Now, for the most part, he was pretty polish. Uh, he was pretty much a polyglot. He pretty much covered every topic. But I'm mostly interested in his historical works. And the book that I'll be reading from for the time being is his history book, The Crusades, from 1937. But he has several books on history and religion and also some books on political philosophy, all of which I consider fair game as we move forward. A lot of the books that he uh, wrote have very similar themes. Basically, that whole thing with Catholicism being more or less indistinguishable from Western civilization is present in a lot of them. He sees everything else as either a threat to the Western tradition or heresy. He hates secularism. He sees it as the cancer of the West. He fears Islam coming back. And he almost invariably refers to the Jewish faith and people in a negative way. Although, to be fair to him, he was not a raging anti-Semite, just kind of your mainstream anti-Semite. So, for instance... When he visited the U.S., he was somewhat horrified that country clubs excluded Jewish people. And also, he thought that the anti-Semitism of the Nazi party was beyond the pale. So, he was not a raging anti-Semite by the standard of his time. But a lot of what he wrote about the Jews would not be publishable today. So, I guess he would have gone broke. Um, politically... He's interesting, too, because, as we mentioned, he served in the Liberal Party. Yet, as we've seen from his social views, he was extremely conservative. He was anti-women's suffrage, and he also did not believe in evolution. But this was a different time, of course. And part of his uh, eccentricity when it comes to trying to fit into the English spectrum is that he was one of the pioneers of distributism. Distributism is not something I'm super familiar with, but it's a Catholic political system which objects to a lot of both socialism and capitalism. So Bellick did not really fit very neatly into the politics of his time, and that may account for his short tenure in Parliament. And um, if you're interested more in distributism, there's actually a channel on YouTube called The Distributist, where the host is a guy who is a distributist, and very much explains what distributism is. And I imagine he's even had some videos on Wells at one point or another. So uh, you should check that out if you're interested in learning more about that particular philosophy. Maybe if people are really interested in Bellic moving forward, I might even look more into that and find some of his writings on that topic. So um, that is pretty much Hilaire Bellic. One of the reasons I chose him, aside from his feud with Wells and also how different his view of the world is, is that Bellick, as we'll see, is a very entertaining writer. He also, in real life, apparently was very charismatic and could really command a room. And that actually comes through very clearly in his writing. His writing is very engaging. And unlike some of Wells's passages, which can be a bit thick and a bit hard to read aloud. Uh, I find that Bellick's writing flows very easily when you're trying to read it aloud. It's very obvious where all the pauses should be, where all the emphases should go. So I feel like uh, he's a very gifted writer, and that's always a good thing, because not only are we studying history, we're also trying to be entertained. Uh, needless to say, for anyone wondering, I agree with basically none of Bellick's ideas, 
but I still find him interesting, and I hope that you will too. So, until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and when we next see Mr. Bellick, we will view the video that I recorded just before this one, where we talk about uh, Bellick's epilogue to the Crusades, where he effectively predicts the return of Islam. In that video, interestingly enough, I actually say that in the future I will introduce Bellick. I was technically correct for anyone trying to point out the opposite in the comments, so consider yourself owned if you've already typed that comment, especially if you left before seeing this part of the video. You got super owned. Anyway, I'm Thersites is the Historian. Remember to follow my stuff, click the notification bell, follow my other channels, etc., etc. I will see you when I see you.